Cool. Uh, so today I would like to talk about serverless on uh, Google App Engine. Um, I would like to talk about why I think EC2 doesn't scale or doesn't scale well. <laughs> <laughs> ah, people like here AWS better than Google App Engine or Google Cloud. Um, how App Engine solved my scaling issue, uh, what Google App Engine actually is. Um, what are the cost considerations uh, when running something serverless? And what are potential downsides? First, a little bit uh, about me. So I love solving problems. I like to keep things uh, simple and stupid, which might uh, say a little bit about my intelligence. Um, I recently joined the most awesome company, Prodigy Finance. We have it on camera. <laughs> Um, I'm a self-proclaimed builder. Uh, I don't know if you people went to the AWS uh, summit, I think, a couple of months ago. So there was a nice talk about what a builder is. Um, join me, uh, add me on Twitter, and Nano is the best. So why does EC2 not scale? Um, well, the most common scaling metric uh, would be out of the box uh, scaling by CPU. Um, but what about the memory usage? Uh, what about I.O.? Uh, what about connections? Um, so what that means is um, an application doesn't always have to scale with CPU, but there will be uh, cases where it will have to scale um, according to the memory usage. Um, due to the nature, because it is VMs, uh, the spin-up times can take anywhere between one and five minutes, if you're lucky. Um, um, but if you get a hit by a lot of traffic, um, let's say someone links you on Hacker News or whatever, uh, in that one minute, you're basically down until you uh, scale. Um, this is not necessarily an issue if you are running uh, large clusters on EC2. Um, and, but even if you had a best case scenario where you would be able to fix the scaling, um, there might be other parts in your application that you still have to consider where scaling will be much, much more difficult than a, a stateless web end. Um, so I like to bring up the controversy and say that auto scaling is a marketing tool uh, or buzzword that Amazon likes to use because EC2 is more expensive than let's say bare metal um, so that's also one of the first things that I, in my history, got always as a feedback, like, do you even auto scale, bro? <laughs> um, so what is Google App Engine? Uh, Google App Engine, uh, there are two types. So there's standard and flexible. Um, I'm only going to talk about the standard version. Um, it's a suite of services. So Lambda, for example, it's basically running functions, but Google App Engine contains a bit more. Uh, so you have the App Engine itself, which is um, somewhere like uh, Heroku or Fargate. Uh, you would have a data store, which would be um, similar to DynamoDB. You have uh, a search, full text search, which is like a simplified version of Elasticsearch. And you get also free uh, shared memcache uh, the instances, uh, but you can also obviously um, up um, by dedicated ones. And the whole suite ties really well into the other uh, G Cloud services, uh, be it storage or um, other things. Um, Google App Engine has a thing that, that I like to call true auto scaling, and that means that. Unlike with EC2, where you will have to have at least, at a minimum, two instances and a load balancer to have it high available, with a Google App Engine, if you have zero traffic, you also pay zero. Um, if you have high traffic, you don't also have to necessarily um, you know, be concerned on how to scale, because they will scale, scale for you. So they scale basically by your credit card. <laughs> So, 
Um, to be fair, AWS as well, but um, the high available availability uh, comes built in uh, because they offer you like a router service which acts like a, a load balancer. And as you can see in the screenshot, you will from time to time you will get a, a log message where it will actually say um, this request took a bit longer because it had to scale. And if you see how long it took to scale, it is 1.5 seconds. So obviously comparing that to an EC2 scaling where it takes more than a minute, um, those are worlds uh, difference. Um, to get App Engine up and running is relatively simple. Um, you have an app a YAML uh, configuration file. Um, the thread safe true is an important bit with certain languages, which I will come back to later. But essentially, it, uh, if it makes sense, it's a bit similar to running Apache as um, Apache Prefork versus um, NPM event or worker. Um, just a very simple index.php. It's a two-liner, but I'm pretty sure I have a syntax error in, in between the lines. And to deploy, they give you a CLI tool, which is uh, written in Python, I think, or Java. Uh, anyway, um, where you can, you basically you specify that up YAML file, and you can just deploy. Um, you will see, so that's like a Jenkins console output. Um, it will upload the files, and it will also do the blue-green deployment for you. So if you specify the version, uh, think of it like with Docker, the tags. So you could, in theory, always overwrite the latest tag, and it will do a blue-green deployment. Or you version every deployment uh, manual, uh, or with a build number, and then you can still play around with uh, traffic splitting. So they offer you a, a tool or an API where you can actually do A-B deployments. Uh, how does it look in a real world example? Um, so I created a very simplistic website called url.rw. Um, so the basic functionality of that website is to hide the HTTP refer. So I'm guessing everybody knows that HTTP refer is site A links to site B. Site B will be able to see uh, from where the visitors came. By injecting my service in between, site B will not know that the visitor came from uh, site A. It's a very simple PHP application, obviously. No database required, uh, as for now. Um, and the goal was to deliver quick and cheap and as reliable as possible. I used additional Cloudflare uh, for some damage control, um, just in case I would be under attack because I have to pay per uh, page impression so it wouldn't rack up bills. So this is basically how it looks like. So you have the target URL and then it will just over the query string, it will append it to url.rw. And if you would click on the mask URL, you would get like a four second or something, you would get like a, a site like this, where then the refer gets um, uh, masked. Uh, Traffic-wise, um, if I look back at August this year, I had almost a million page impressions on a day, uh, on a single day, which is quite a lot of traffic. Um, for the whole month, that was uh, 16 uh, million page impressions. At the bottom, you will see like the fancy marketing graph uh, right now, 4,000 visitors, but obviously that's not true because that is the visitors or recorded sessions over a time frame of 30 minutes. Um, in reality, it looked a bit more like this. So uh, basically, I had up to, f on the uh, top graph, I had up to 40 concurrent connections on a single second. Uh, but if you look at the bottom graph, um, that is the actual instance that are being billed. And uh, yeah, I'm colorblind, but I'm guessing the middle graph greenish. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can see, so that is the actual billable instances, which means uh, even though I had 40 concurrent uh, requests, I was billed max with maybe 
two instances at a time. So how did App Engine solve my scaling issue? Um, well, it is a bit easier of a problem to solve because um, I didn't have any database, um, but it was high traffic nonetheless. Um, the unique selling point of a service like this is really um, high availability and low response times because it's not like it's not a rocket science a service and there are lot, tons of other services so people can just jump ship very quick. Um, I did some cost analysis and at that time T2 Nano didn't exist yet so running EC2 with ELB uh, was a bit was too expensive. Digital Ocean, I'm not so quite a big fan because they don't have really good uptimes. And uh, App Engine perfectly scaled, um, uh, minimizing the cost during days where I had zero traffic, but then when it showed up, um, I actually even didn't notice because I don't even have monitoring, but I just knew it works. Um, and for those 15 million page impressions, I had a bill of $10. <laughs> yes, uh, I hope it's not a bug and now they figure it out and they're going to fix it. <laughs> so I hope this is a feature. Um, anyways, uh, so um, EC2 is more expensive than bare metal or rented dedicated. And yet we keep advocating, well, let's use EC2. And I hear a lot always like, well, serverless is expensive, Fargate is expensive, Lambda is super expensive. but that is only one point, and if you translate maybe an application one-to-one, -one, yeah, it's going to be more expensive. Um, so you cannot always do a direct comparison. Um, using EC2 um, means also that you're always going to have that minimum uh, cost of running an application. Um, you have to have two EC2 instances. You have to have a load balancer. And uh, last but not least, um, this is not an advice to move everything to serverless. Everything has a purpose, um, but it is hopefully showing that uh, you don't need to be afraid of the cost when running serverless. Obviously, there are some downsides. Um, vendor locking, uh, though realistically, you're vendor locking yourself in many other uh, areas of your application. Uh, it can get very expensive when you do batch processing because you really pay for every CPU cycle and every byte that gets transferred gets actually built. Um, you have to work with tools that kind of fit in that whole ecosystem. So building a serverless app, but then maybe using uh, a MySQL database that doesn't scale so well uh, is maybe not a good idea. Optimize your application. Uh, so I wouldn't run maybe a Laravel framework on it. Um, and one criticism from my side is also that the Google App Engine standard uh, billing is quite complicated to understand. So that is because they take uh, multiple metrics into consideration for the end bill. Um, and it's not as simple as saying, well, you ran an instance now for so and so many hours, even though that is what the uh, pricing page says. Um, any questions? Um, hi, my name is Tom. Uh, why was your comparison between EC2 and Google App Engine and not Google App Engine and Elastic Beanstalk? Uh, so Elastic Beanstalk is essentially EC2 with a load balancer, but with some additional features. Uh, those features wouldn't, I don't think they would necessarily add too much on the costs, um, but I'm also not really using Elastic Beanstalk anymore. Um, but yeah, I don't think it would add too much to the cost as Elastic Beanstalk. But the, the underlying technology of Elastic Beanstalk is still easy to unload balancer.
Uh, to your point on um, you wouldn't deploy Laravel, do you think maybe that's why your costs were so low? Um, because you had a probably a blazingly fast, very slim PHP script running there, but if you deployed a Laravel or a Django, then the processing would be higher and it probably would be exponentially more expensive. Um, yes and no. So I would most probably argue that running Laravel on EC2 is expensive as well because it is a very he heavy framework as opposed to running a very slim down or using a slimmer framework. Um, but I'm also actually, so that's not the only project that I'm running on Google App Engine. I'm also running a more, I'm not going to call it more sophisticated, but a more heavier project. And the pricing also seems uh, is very much the same, near to zero, if you have, if you're below. Uh, so the good thing with Google App Engine is they give you a lifelong free tier. So with AWS, you have that only with very few services. Usually, if you have free tiers, then it's like 12 months and only in your first account. But Google App Engine, you have a free tier lifelong. And if you, so if you're below that free tier, then obviously everything is free. And that free tier is enough for at least 100 or 1,000 visitors per day using uh, NoSQL, so their data store, even. Thank you.